Let me tell you a story about Null. So the year was 2017 and I was sitting on my desk working, writing code. I got a call from my uh, mobile operator company, the customer service. And the guy says, is this Gaurav Null speaking? And I was like, uh, can you say that again? He again says, is it Gaurav Null speaking? Uh, it was so hard for me to comprehend what, what is this last name that the guy is speaking. I asked, I asked him again, what do you mean? He's like, is this God of Null speaking? And it was the third time it clicked my mind. Oh God, <laughs> I, I kind of know what's happening now. So it effectively meant that they haven't handled Null case. And in, in his console, he was probably seeing the last name as Null, N-U-L-L, -L, uh, <laughs> which was so weird. Okay, we'll get into handling nulls towards the later part of the video. Stay tuned. Okay, folks, uh, welcome to 100 GB. You are watching episode seven of the Clean Code series, which is all about uh, error handling. The series is all about this great book called Clean Code by Robert C. Martin. This series shouldn't be thought of as stringent guidelines that you need to follow. No. The motivation here is to optimize for the reading of the code, write code in a way that the reader is like less pissed off or even better if reader is, is like, aha, this is pretty reasonable. This is how I would have written it. So it kind of sounds weird to have this topic in the clean code series, but this is something that we as programmers deal with every single day. Inputs can be abnormal, devices can fail, network can fail, things can go wrong. And when they do go wrong, it's our job to uh, make sure the software behaves in a reasonable way. And what we discuss here is mostly around Java, but can be extended to JavaScript and other languages for the most part. Okay, let's uh, come to the first topic, which is exceptions versus return codes. The first thing here is when to use exceptions over error codes. So the first use cases are unexpected errors, which can span multiple functions and where your code can't do anything. And it's only the higher layer code that can take some action. Let's take an example of the code. So the code you are seeing is from uh, Android open source project. The name of the class is application package manager. This method is probably called by applications to get information for a certain package, which can be any other application or the same application. Uh, this, the name of the package is get package info and it throws a name not found exception. Okay, let's see what this method does. This method calls another internal method, which calls another method and Okay, which is probably calling some other method, which is uh, actually bringing up the information and it is doing some internal memcache thing. So in this kind of scenario where you cannot, you cannot actually take any action as the author of this code and you really need to propagate this error to the clients and you need to propagate this error across multiple functions. Well, the only option you have is exceptions. And you can do it with the with the error codes as well. It's just more painful. Let's come to the second use case. So it's also preferred for clear mistakes in the code, like a wrong argument, which is illegal argument exception, uh, which in the case of Dart, I think is argument error or something. Uh, or uh, there could be no permissions, which in Java case is generally a security exception. And similarly, we have like similar exceptions across multiple languages. Let's come to the third use case. The good thing about exceptions is that they provide an implicit way to separate out the normal code from the exception handling code. Let's take a look at the code from the book. So there is this method called send shutdown. It probably sends the shutdown command or something. It gets the device handled. Uh, checks if it's not invalid, then uh, it checks the state and does a few things. Okay, then it checks if the device is ready. Uh, if it's ready, uh, it does all of uh, all these things uh, and shuts down the device finally over here. Closes the device and removes it from the device registry. And also things to note here is that if the device is not in ready state, this code does nothing. If the device uh, is currently inactive, then again, it does nothing. So how about rewriting this code to something like this? Okay, so now if you see this, the new state of the function, we have simplified the code in, in the sense that we have separated the 
error handling from the normal flow of the code. So here you have the normal flow of the code, which has nothing to do with the error handling. And here we have the real error handling. And actually it just throws the error and this error will be thrown on the stack. Uh, I mean, on this line and this execution will be stopped. Uh, uh, because anyway, the method over here was doing nothing. Okay, next, let's see when to use error codes. So the first use case is when you have some specific error scenarios for the functions at hand. Let's take a look at some code. So a very classic example is when you're writing some server code and you have a few exceptions or few, not exceptions, few error codes that you want to return to client so that either client can take some action or client can show some error to the, uh, to the user in the form of a user interface. So we have this, let's say it's a web service. This, this, uh, this class is running on your website, on your web server. This method is called, uh, maybe as a result of some rest API call, you get the username and the password. You see if the user exists, if, if the user doesn't exist, you return this error code. If the password is incorrect, you return this error code. If the account is logged, you return this error code. So in this case is perfectly fine and it makes sense as well. Let's get to the next use case. Error code should be preferred for performance critical scenarios. Let's say you're working on, a, on writing a kernel driver or maybe on operating system library, which could be called concurrently by multiple apps, multiple times. It doesn't make a lot of sense to use exception for common failures as there is certain overhead to throwing exceptions. Now, the first overhead is it requires new object allocation because you're creating a new object when you, you're throwing an exception. And the second uh, overhead is that the at least in Java, JVM needs to unwind the stack trace and populate it into the exception. That is one of the benefits of the exception as well, which we'll get to uh, in a moment. And which would be true for other languages and other uh, sort of VMs as well, because when you throw an exception, the entire stack trace has to be recorded as part of that exception. Okay, let's get to the benefits of exceptions. First is easier to debug. Well, this point is a little debatable, but for the sake of simplicity, let's go ahead with it. I always find exceptions easier to debug if I uh, if I get to see the stack trace. Now, stack trace gives you the entire order of the call stack, which helps to pinpoint the problem. If you want to see the example of stack trace, just use uh, like guard and it'll give you some good stack traces. Let's come to the limitations of uh, exceptions. Now these are slow because of the reasons mentioned earlier and sometimes they end up catching a lot of false positives. Let's take a look at the code. Let's say you have this method uh, that says do cool stuff and it does some complex stuff. It catches the runtime exception and it just print, prints out some uh, log statement. Uh, it doesn't even print the stack trace. Now this is weird, this is disastrous. Now, this, this complex stuff can throw some error which you actually don't want to handle. You want it to propagate it to the uh, to the stack and so that this application is killed or whatever. And you get to see that in the logs, but that will not happen here. And I'm pretty sure every programmer encounters this situation at least once in their career, that there is some code, it is supposed to be throwing some exception, but so the exception is being caught somewhere and you don't want that. Yeah, so be cautious when you're using these catch statements. Okay, let's go to the next section, which says that you should write the try catch finally first. What does it mean? Let's take a look at the code. So you have this code, have this class user, and there is this method that reads the user from the file, given the file name, does some stuff, uh, starts the stream and post. So, so let's say when you're writing this function, it's advisable before you actually, when you write this first line, you know the exception will be thrown here. Take a moment and write the catch block, write the finally block, and think about all the edge cases here. So when the, if the exception happens over here and you go to catch, what will be the return value here? Will it be null or will it be user with some empty values? And th th that's, that's the entire point of this particular section, that you define the scope first and make sure that the state is restored properly in the catch block or in the finally block. And doing this will actually enforce you to think about the edge cases. Let's go to the next section, which is uh, using unchecked exceptions. So what 
are checked or unchecked exceptions. Let's take a look at the code. So let's say you have this method that, that throws a checked exception. So this exception class, all the all the exceptions that inherit the exception class are actually checked exceptions. And all the classes that, uh, all the exceptions that inherit the runtime exception are actually unchecked exceptions. So there is this function that throws unchecked exception. So the problem is that when you call the function that throws the checked exception, compiler will throw an error here. Right now my compiler is not showing an error because of some weird stuff going on. But anyway, it won't let you compile uh, this first statement. In order for you to compile it, you need to wrap it with a try catch. You basically need to catch the exception. Okay. Yeah, so th and that, that's the only difference between a checked and an unchecked exception that for the checked exceptions, you need to catch them. Catch them or rethrow them uh, in the method. Like the other option is uh, that this method can declare that it, it throws the exception and the compiler will be satisfied as far as the, this method is concerned. So the problem is that if you are working on a code which is called by multiple layers already and you have a new checked exception in the throws clause. So for this uh, example, if, let's say if this method is already called by a lot of uh, methods and now if I'm adding this throws clause with a checked exception, the life will become super hard because now I need to go to all the methods in like up the chain and either catch the exception or rethrow them. And that's the reason it's generally suggested to use unchecked exceptions. But it can't be strictly followed though, because we, we do need checked exceptions for cases where an exception is likely to happen. Now these cases can be uh, you are reading in and out of the disk or for cases involving a network IO or for cases involving inter-process communication because hey, the process might be down, which happens very frequently. Okay, let's go to the next section. Define exception classes in terms of callers needs. Okay, what does it mean? Exceptions are always defined to optimize for the callers. Now book has an example, which is also good. I wanted to take a more like practical example and here we have the code from Android X. Okay, by the way, Android X is a library maintained by the Android team, which like using which it becomes easier to write apps even for the previous versions of Android. Okay, let's take a look at this code. There is this create method, which creates an instance of the car hardware manager, like used to interact with the hardware of the car. And over here, it catches two exceptions and then it throws an illegal state exception. So the alternative here is to throw these two exceptions directly instead of catching them here and then throwing an illegal state exception. But if you see from the point of view of the caller, there is this create method. And if you see these weird exceptions, name not found, and then reflective operation exception, it doesn't make any sense for the caller. I mean, for the caller, illegal state exception still makes sense to some extent, but at least not these two. So, and that is what the point of this section is. You need to optimize for the caller. For cases like these, uh, it's simpler and better to just throw a common and more appropriate exception that makes more sense for the caller. Okay, uh, the next section, don't abuse exceptions. A lot of times exceptions just don't make sense and and the case can be handled generously within the normal code itself. Let's take a code example from the book. Okay, so the, here is this method called calculate meal expenses total. It get the meal expenses from the uh, from this DAO app object for a given employee. So it is it is basically calculating the total of the expenses depending on whether or not the meal was reimbursed. So if the meal was reimbursed, it gets the like the, the actual amount. If it wasn't uh, reimbursed, then it gets the, like the per DM uh, for that employee. Now over here, uh, it is slightly weird to like, this is like an overuse of the exception because you actually don't need exceptions here. It's not a very unexpected case. A generous way uh, to handle this is like create a new class that extends meal expenses and then override the get total method, return the per uh, meal per DM amount, whatever. And make sure and adjust your DAO object in a way that if the employee doesn't exist or if the amount was reimbursed, it returns an instance of the meal expense per diem. And yeah, your, your code becomes super simple. No need to handle any exception or anything. Just return the total from the meal expenses object that is returned from here. Okay, let's talk about our best friend, null. 
well it's kind of our worst enemy as well and you've already heard the story uh, at the beginning of the video if you haven't just go back to the starting of the video okay one learning from the story is that whatever you are learning from this book it has a deep impact not only on the code but to the end user as well first thing here is don't return null just don't do it it makes the caller's life super hard and funny at the same time unnecessary null checks and potential null pointer exceptions that's part of the reason all the modern languages have null safety built in be it dart kotlin typescript like nullability is now hardwired into the system uh, you would ask me okay gorov that's fine then what to do with the code that we are writing these days in java well, let's take a look at the code okay here is this super simple method that says uh, read user from file now let's say it can return a null which it shouldn't so the next best thing to do here is there is this annotation in java called nullib so you can configure your compiler or the static analyzer in such a way that you cannot assign null to a field that doesn't have this annotation and that's it and if a field is nullable, the static analyzer forces you to put a null check everywhere you use it, which means that whenever you call this method and you try to execute a method on that user, the returned object, the compiler will just throw an error. Not the compiler, maybe the analyzer won't let you compile uh, saying that you need to add a null check. And in addition to that, you can also use optional class. So it, it's, it's a very nice utility available in Java that can be used to denote the absence of a value explicitly. Well, we use it all day here at Google. And let's see how it looks with this code. So that's what you will do. Remove the nullable and do this optional of user so it's a class that wraps an object it has a few methods to like see whether or not this object is actually present in this class or not and similarly just don't pass null to a function like one is don't return null from a function and don't pass null to the function as an argument and the reasons are effectively the same as i mentioned before and why don't you consider sharing this video to your friends and batchmates like who also aspire to be great at writing code remember prioritizing clean error handling leads to better software behavior and a smoother experience for both developers and the end users subscribe to this channel hit that like button you were watching 100 gb and i will see you in the next one